So they were the first official Jews to come to this country, and there were 23 of them, mainly women. What, what year was that? When was that? 1654. Oh, wow. How many of you have been to the museum? That used to be the National Museum of American Jewish History. Now it's the Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History. How many of you have been there? The one you can it out. Yeah. OK, you've yeah. all been there. Right. OK. Yeah. And I was a docent there when it first opened. So I have very extensive docent training, and my favorite floor was the, the fifth floor, which is the one that goes from 1654 to 1880. Uh, that's the one we're not discussing. <laughs> <laughs> but we can go to the fifth floor. <laughs> you can certainly go to the fifth floor and move the way down. Uh, but uh, I, I really love that part of the museum best. Uh, however, um, uh, in that part of the museum, you, you get a background on the early Jewish communities and the early settlers, the early people who came to the colonies before the revolution, and then the revolution and thereafter. Uh, and so, what we call the Sephardi period is only really Sephardi because that's where all the synagogues were. But by the 1720s, 1730, most of the immigrants coming in were not Sephardi, they were Ashkenazi. So the overwhelmingly majority of Jews in America, almost from the very beginning, were, were Ashkenazi, which means they come from Europe. Eastern Europe, Northern and Eastern Europe. Okay, West, beginning from sort of Central Europe, Germany. But now Germany did not exist until 1871. Yeah. So it'll be relevant in this course, but not in anything before that. Uh, but the, the they, they, they started coming from East, well, actually, they started coming from, some of them coming from Eastern Europe. Actually, when the 23 Sephardi Jews got to New York, there was already one Ashkenazi Jew there. So, yeah, there's always somebody there before you, even if you're the first to come, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that guy was a, um, was, was, a was a butcher. Uh, uh, let's see, what's name? More Simpson? Anyway, he was a butcher, and he did, he did kosher slaughtering as well as regular slaughtering. So, you know. For whom? Well, so the 23 Jews who were there. I mean, if they wanted kosher meat, they could slaughter it that way. Uh, but when he, like most Americans, he made his, his, his living not off of the Jews, but of the rest of the population. Uh, so, um, but up until the time of the revolution, these Ashkenazi Jews, wherever they came from, and some of them came from Eastern Europe, which is where the first one came from. Uh, but because uh, the, the, the Ashkenazi could have come from anywhere in Northern and Eastern Europe to begin with. Uh, many of them came through England or Amst from London or Amsterdam. Uh, and Amsterdam is where the original Sephardi men would come from. They came via Amsterdam. And uh, the synagogues they built were modeled on the uh, Spanish-Portuguese synagogue in 
Amsterdam or the Beavis March in London, actually, but they closer to the one in Amsterdam. And of course, the oldest still remaining synagogue that's actually still now in use again, I won't say still, is Newport. Um, beautiful synagogue, um, which is built on the outside not to look like a synagogue, but to look like every other building in Newport. But on the inside, it is modeled after uh, the uh, Spanish Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam. Okay, so that was 3,000 Jews. They were here. Lots of lots been written about them. There aren't very many. However, things start to change after 1820. Start to get more immigrants coming. And that's also true uh, for regular migration. Uh, American immigrants in the mid 19th century were coming from where? Germany. What? No, Jews. No, not the, Jews. Okay, I've got to be Americans. Yeah. Yeah. Either. Ireland. No, that's the 40s, 50s. Okay, that's a specific, those are the first significant group of Catholics to come. Most of the others before that had been Protestants. Okay. Uh, and where were they coming from? England? Yeah, England, yeah. The, and most of the colonists were coming from England, okay, before the, before the revolution. But thereafter, in the 19th century, not so many are coming from England so much as coming from... Scotland? What? Scotland. Some. Yeah. Scotland and England would be from Germany. Yes. Germany. With some coming from Germany, but more, higher percentage of German Jews, German-speaking Jews, okay, is what I'm saying. They weren't even German speaking, some of them were Yiddish speaking, but okay, we'll call them German speaking Jews. Uh, yeah, higher percentage of them came to the United States rather than higher percentage of Germans who came here. But there was a wave of sort of German immigration, and also there were immigrants from, as, as this country was expanding westward. Where were the immigrants coming from? Not Jewish. Not Jewish. Russia. What? Russia. Russia is German. Okay. <laughs> and, but the question wasn't all Germans, you know, but Russia in the East was Polish, okay, okay. Uh, but, uh, and I just the Italians, the what, what? Italians. No, no, the Italians come later. No, the Scandinavians. There were Swedish and Norwegian, oh, okay. and all of the, all of the agricultural settlements in the Midwest, uh, you know, in Minnesota, in I, don't, I mean, you know, all of the states that were beyond the Mississippi, those, many of them were coming from, well, Northern Europe for sure, okay, but not necessarily England. Uh, and, but the Jews, well, we're not living in uh, Scandinavia, uh, not in any significant numbers at all. Uh, they were coming from, generally from German-speaking areas, so they're called German, from what is Germany, uh, and uh, the, and that's uh, and they're different from the first wave of both Sparty and Ashkenazi. What makes them different from their predecessors who had come before 1820? Maybe it's their class or no. some place in no. Well, Class okay. and society. Class. Like class and society. No, most immigrants come in the same class in society. Most immigrants are poor. They can't be the poorest of the poor because they had to be able to get here. Okay? But uh, they are like gen generally not the wealthiest class. The wealthiest are comfortable enough where they are, so they don't have to leave. But people who do leave are from the say, lower middle class, Jews don't have a peasant class. Uh, so they, but they, a lot of Jews in Europe were, well, peddlers or craftsmen, artisans. Okay. So they, beginning in the, the early wave and then certainly in the mid 19th century, the Jews were coming from a background tending to be peddlers, small peddlers. So when we came, well, you came to Eastern Europe. That would be that. That would be Eastern European. That's the next wave. Area. Did they become peddlers when they came to the country? Many or they were peddlers. Many had been peddlers before. That's a very common Jewish occupation up until the end of the 18th Even century. In Europe. Even in Europe. Well, Jews went small scale commerce, okay? Which meant that they were either, they started out as peddlers with a pack on their back, 
And then they graduate, maybe having a horse and wagon. And then if they're really successful in this country, it doesn't happen as often in Europe, then they become merchants with shopkeepers, shopkeepers, okay? And the ones who were really, really successful in this, in this period of the 19th century, even though they came poor in 1820, 1830, maybe 1840, uh, by the 1860s and 70s, some of them were opened department stores, which is why just about all of the major department stores in this country, beginning in the 19th century and up till fairly recently, uh, they have been Jews, because Jews had experience in commerce. And the other people who came to this country, no matter where they came from, tended to be agricultural, unskilled, essentially, in, in urban occupations. So they did heavy industry and Jews did textiles. Uh, which doesn't quite start in this early period, but it will be that way by the 1880s. Um, so they are, okay, so we know that they are not particularly wealthy, that if they have skills, they're coming with, with commercial skills, but sometimes they can make things. Um, they can be craftspeople, they can be tailors, uh, or they can be peddlers. Okay, that's what they come from, and that's what they're going to do here. What else is characteristic of the German wave, the Central European wave? Who is it who would like you to come? Families, men, women, children, who comes to people? Men. Men, exactly. Paving the way for the others. That's right. What we have in this country, like many other countries, is a process of chain migration. So they come, generally unmarried, and they set out to find, to, you know, they, they're going to peddle in areas that don't need peddlers, okay? You go someplace where there aren't established communities yet. But you need to have supplies. So who is going to send you, sell you supplies? Jews. Jews. Mm -hmm. So Jews, who are your, your predecessors who came, you know, 10, 20 years earlier and have established themselves, they can, in many cases, be the suppliers for the next group of peddlers who come along. Okay. Now, often they are related to each other, or they came from the same places, or they, it is a change migration. So, but in the period of the mid 19th century, the Jews are no longer settling exclusively on the East Coast. They're still Jews on the East Coast, of course. And, and by that point, uh, New York is still is the largest community, and there's a large number of community Jews in New York, and there's still a whole lot on the East Coast. Uh, seacoast, but this Central European wave of immigration settles where, in many cases? But like Chicago, mm -hmm. Denver, things like that? Midwest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Starting an area, what, Cincinnati becomes a, a really major Jewish center mm -hmm. uh, in the 19th century, and that's why you have, up until now, Hebrew Union College, which is the Reformed Rabbinical School, uh, was established in Cincinnati in the 1870s, and it was the first real rabbinical school established in this country. Uh, and so Cincinnati was a major center, but there are also, you know, St. Louis and Milwaukee and Chicago, and you, you know, all of these towns, cities actually, by, by, the, by that point, of Jews now established communities in many of these places. German Jews, or German-speaking Jews, or Western Yiddish-speaking Jews, call whatever you want. But uh, they, so they are, start out with nothing, and then if they're successful, they establish themselves in a small town someplace, or maybe in a city. But most of that period, they're fairly small towns, none of these cities are huge. Okay, so the Jews are urban, whereas the other immigrants are virtually all agricultural. It's the way it was in Europe. The Jews were urban, and just about everybody else were peasants, farmers, landowners, whatever. There were very, very few Jews living on, on, engaged in agriculture in the um, in the, the, the mid nineteenth century. In the United States, they can. I mean, but on Europe. Often that was the case, and that's why they didn't. Okay. 
okay, but when they come over here, yes, they can. And so among the Eastern European Jews that come later, some of them do, uh, do have homesteads and do, you know, and you also have, you know, the chicken farmers in uh, Vineland and um, Baron von Hirsch. Yeah, well, Baron von Hirsch out west. And in Connecticut. In Connecticut too? Yeah. My, my family had a big farm in Connecticut, mm -hmm. funded by Baron yeah. So there were some Jewish farmers in this country. Uh, they don't tend to last more than one, probably perhaps two generations. It's still there. Still there. <laughs> still there. Still there. <laughs> still there. The Himmelstein farm. <laughs> the farm is still there. 113, 100, well, it's even. There's still Himmelstein. So Himmelstein is still owned by the Himmelsteins, yeah. Do they actually work it? Yes, they do. But they, they went, in, in, in 2010, they went from dairy to organic vegetables. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they they don't take the it. cows anymore. Uh, <laughs> this, this is not. You know, at Connecticut, the oldest, oldest Jewish farm in Connecticut. <laughs> okay, but um, we did, there was one time Congress went from, from Connecticut, uh, his parents were farmers, uh, got, you know, he answered the Jew. But it was all there about Paris, who, who yes. they took loans from. That's right. But, and that they were also, but they, they were Eastern European Jews, they yes. were not Central European Jews. Right. So they came in the, la the late 19th century. There is a wave of Jews who think they're going to become productive by going into agriculture. If they're really lucky and they can develop some skills, they can stick it out. Most cases, it's, it's just about the, the current generation. He has a PhD in in agriculture from, you know, <laughs> oh, from that's great. UMass, but he's still running it. So. That, that's yeah. great. I mean, yeah. I mean, you want to do it? You have to do it better these right. days. I mean, you know, and you have to do it bigger. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. But uh, but Central European farmers, not too many. Although um, my daughter-in-law's grandparents, grandfather. Family. They came from a small town in Germany in the, the 1920s and they were allowed into Canada because they were engaged in the cattle. So they have a, bought a farm, which they had quite a few years ago, and, uh, and uh, they, they, but eventually got the, the, the older generation got into the import export business of cattle. Okay? So, uh, so, but Jews, that's not what Jews typically do, and those were Central European Jews who did it, so obviously there were occasional ones, but uh, in most cases, they're not going, they're going to live in towns or cities or small towns, lots of small town Jews, beginning with this German wave of immigration and continuing also with the Eastern European immigration. And we tend to forget about them because Jews today, by and large, don't live in small town Jewish communities. However, there are still small town Jewish communities, and uh, my son, who's a medievalist, specializes in small town Jewish communities in the United States. He was just in Hawaii for a week, and uh, talking to, to the Jewish community of Honolulu, which aren't exact, isn't exactly a small town, mm -hmm. but it's a small town community. It's a small community there and around, and they have to get organized, and they need leadership. So he is training the leadership for small town Jewish communities. And there's a center at, the, at, at Colby College in Maine that is a center for, for small town Jewish communities. And he helped to set it up. And he's, I guess, one of his positions. Anyway, so they still exist, right? And I won't be talking about them for the rest of the semester. Right? <laughs> but anyhow, the, um, so, so they settle in different places and they are engaged, you know, on Virtually all of them are going to be engaged in commerce of some kind, and then they go gradually farther and farther west. And so they get to California in the 1840s, 50s, the, the gold rush, um, and Jews are involved in the gold rush, but they are not digging for gold. They are making clothing and selling things to, to, the, to, the, to the miners. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. So they, uh, so, and of course, from that we get Levi Strauss, Levi Strauss. right? Yes. Absolutely. And you know, he he and his partners, um, you know, invented the uh, rivets. the rivets. Okay, that you use in jeans today. They're still on jeans. That's right. They're very good now. You're still riveted. Yes. <laughs> And anyway, the zippers too. <laughs> they, they got into zippers eventually, I think. Uh, but uh, at any rate. But Jews, you know, those are the fields that Jews get into. But to begin with, they are single men who come. 
And uh, after a number of years here, if they're reasonably successful, they tend to, well, the earlier generation has to go back to Europe to find whites, because there are not too many Jewish women here. So, and in the mid to late 19th century, um, intermarriage is a, is a major issue in this country. It's not a new problem. Even in the colonial era, there was some intermarriage. But in that era, if you intermarried, you sort of uh, were kicked out of the Jewish community, unless you're the man. The man who intermarries somehow can be a member of the Jewish community, even if his wife can't be, his kids are maybes. But by the mid 19th century, um, you know, some famous people do have kids who intermarry and somehow remain in the Jewish community. Uh, Isaac Mayer Wise, who was the most important reform rabbi of the 19th century, his daughter intermarried, but still somehow remained Jewish. And, you know, because her father was Isaac Mayer Wise, she could go to shul. I mean, you know, <laughs> she's Jewish, nothing. But, but, but at any rate, there, was, there weren't all that many Jewish women around, so there was nobody for these Jewish men to marry. Uh, so they would go back home to Germany or to German speaking villages that they came from. And they came from the small towns, they don't come from cities. If you're living in a small town or you know, a small town in, in Central Europe, what you do if you are relatively successful is if you can, you either move to a larger city, a larger center, or you move westward, maybe you land up in England or someplace like that, or you move to the United States. That's, um, that's the pattern of mobility. But the, uh, but the ones who come here, single, men, not very well, well to do, many of them do remarkably well here. They don't all do remarkably well, and that's why we don't hear about many of them, because there's nothing really to say. They came here, they somehow made a living, and they married somebody, maybe somebody they brought over from Germany or from Europe, or maybe somebody who was born here. Uh, uh, it's a very small, these are very small communities who are going to be in the Midwest, but they grew up. And, um, and they continue to speak, well, these, sometimes these German speaking Jews settled in German speaking communities, Milwaukee. Okay. So uh, that they fit, even though they weren't necessarily beer drinkers, but they could come. Uh, and they never did it in the beer business, but uh, they, they, uh, sometimes settled among other Germans, but basically Jews, when they come to this country, when are they coming here to begin with? What, what is the pull factor of the United States? The streets are paved with gold. What? The streets are paved with gold. Well, even before the streets were paved with gold, that's, from East, that's Eastern Europe. <laughs> because I suspect that nobody thought the streets were paved with gold in 1850. <laughs> they were not. They weren't escaping any Semitism. No. no. They, the primary reason for coming from Central Europe, and the reason most Jews eventually come from Eastern Europe too, is not because of persecution there, or not because they wanted to live a Jewish life here. No, if you wanted to live a Jewish life, you stayed in Europe. If you wanted to have Jewish learning, if you wanted to, you know, be really Jewish, we stayed home. There was nobody was preventing you from being Jewish in Europe. They might not treat you very well, but you know, you didn't come here to be a better Jew. You came here to earn a better living because there were more possibilities and more opportunities for people who had very little. So the men come first, especially if they find a wife somewhere and somehow. Well, I guess I should have mentioned that in the earlier period there were Jews in fur trading business too. Got the frontier and buying and selling fur. They were hunting it, but they were buying it. Uh, that's true in Canada as well. Um, maybe some other time I'll teach Canadian Jews, but not this year. Um, the so they come for economic reasons because they can make a living here. And depending on when they come, that will help to determine where they settle and what they're going to do for a living. It's related, but okay, once you come sooner, you do better first. Okay. You establish yourself, you do well. So the year you come is probably the most important factor. Uh, not so much where you come from, but in different periods, they can predominantly from certain areas, other areas. So, um, you're, uh, 
So the period until the German period lasts up until, it really lasts up until the late the end of the 19th century, but maybe up to 1870, 1880. And now I say that is because beginning in 1870, 1880, especially after the Revolution work, you start getting Jews coming predominantly from Eastern Europe. And some of them are indeed coming because of anti-Semitism, but also because they were getting desperately poor. The Jews were restricted as to where they could live and um, what they could do for a living. And so there are all kinds of restrictions that remain in Eastern Europe up until World War I. In Germany, Jews were emancipated by the 1870s, uh, but um, so they're not so much coming because they're persecuted. Uh, they're coming because they might have good jobs and they want uh, to live as, uh, as, you know, as productively as they can. Also, there were limitations in Germany, not in Eastern Europe, but in Germany and in Moravia. Uh, there were limitations on who could get married in the early 19th century. You had needed permission to get married, and sometimes only one son in the family was allowed to legally get married. Permission from, from the who? government? From the government, yes. So and this was for Jews. Jews, Jews, Jews. yes. Jews, Jews only, no. Jews only, Jews only. I mean, this is a you know, that they were restrictions on Jewish communities, and they last a little bit longer in Moravia than they do in Germany, but still, they're there. Uh, and uh, so, another reason people come here because they have more freedom occupationally in terms of marriage. Okay. Now, the, in the late 19th century, the intermarriage rate here was far basically higher than in, in Europe because very few Jews in the early half of the 19th century intermarried in either Central Europe or Eastern Europe. Uh, however, later on, more we're going to do so and more we're going to do so in this country because being in this country meant that you did not have to affiliate with the Jewish community if you didn't want to. It's voluntary. Well, it's, it seems to be voluntary, right? But from the very beginning, most Jews who come here, almost all of the Jews who come here, are not trying to escape from being Jewish. They're trying to escape from living in a restricted way, either occupationally, marital way, family, whatever. Not, but they don't mind being Jews. And often, they, if they're the only Jew in town, they could easily, you know, eventually intermarry and disappear in the town. But uh, most Jews identify as Jews and continue to identify as Jews. And most Jews eventually will affiliate with the Jewish community that exists. Okay. And the reasons for affiliating with the Jewish community are, when you first come over, why would you bother to hook up to some Jewish community someplace, even if it was not quite where you're living? Contacts, I guess, for business. Contacts for business, to get set up in business and to, uh, you know, get a business partner if you're just coming here and you don't know anybody. Uh, and often it's going to be a family member or cousin or what have you, but you need contacts. But why else would you join a community? To find a wife. Or a well, to find a wife, except most of your wife, your wife, in the early period, you're going to have to go back to Europe. For in the Eastern European period, they're going to come here and often periods where single women come even more often than single men do. Sometimes married men come first, but their wives are expected to come later. Right. That's Eastern European, not German Jews. The German Jews came single and they went back to find a wife, or the wives came, somebody else's sister came along with them when they were, when they, you, 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 you want some business partners, so you have a bunch of siblings in Central Europe. So you send back for your siblings and some of them come with their, with their sister and their in-laws and major family, friends, people in the same town. And that persists into the Eastern European immigration period, especially for small town Jews. Using my favorite example of Waterville, Maine, because it's the only small town Jewish community I really know well, um, the half the town were Levines who had come from this obscure town in Lithuania. Never heard of the town before. Mm -hmm. But in Waterbury, that's where many of their families came from. And they still remain related to each other to this day. Okay? 
They were the most successful Jews in Waterville, which is why they bought their whole first book. So anyway, so that's happening all over. And it's true not only in Portland, Maine, it's true in Portland, Oregon, too. I mean, really, it's all over the place. Uh, OK, so you come, you affiliate with the synagogue so that, well, first of all, you speak to people with Jews. I mean, they, the men all have a basic Jewish education in the early, late 19th century, it's really Eastern Europe. If, if anybody has any formal education in the family at all, it's the men who went to a cater minimally or went there or went to secular institutions. In Eastern Europe, however, the Jewish girls were better educated secularly than the Jewish boys. So, uh, <laughs> so some of these, uh, but in Germany, but both would be educated by this time because they were all were public school, at least for primary school, or sometimes a Jewish school. But they come with, um, with some Jewish knowledge, basically. And that's whatever they have when they get here. That is, uh, they have what they brought with them. Before the 1840s, there are no rabbis. Communal employees were called Kazan ministers. Most of them, some of them really was with Sephardim. Most of them were support. Joshua Satius, who was the Kazan rabbi in the Food Revolution in New York, uh, it turned out his father was Sephardi, that's how Satius gets there, and his mother was Ashkenaz. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, so those were, those were mixed marriages in those days. <laughs> uh, they still are, I guess, today, but uh, but not as mixed as some of the others. Um, they're, they're within the family, so to speak, the extended thing. Um, okay, so they come and they settle where their other Jews settle or where they can establish themselves. They get going with the business and then eventually settle down. And at that point, they need a wife, so they get a wife somehow, either in Europe or back east. Uh, and then they settle there, and that's why in virtually every small town in this country, at one point or another, not every, in most, one time or another, you had Jewish business on the main street, just about every town. True in the Central European period, with fewer places, but in the Eastern European community, you had Jews living virtually everywhere. And, and there, and they, they're, it's like, I don't know, there's a, there's a memoir that's called Jutan or something like that. Um, they, uh, they, the Jews lived separately from everybody else in whatever town they lived in, and they have the local general store, or eventually the local department store, or other haberdashers, or, or, or um, dry goods merchants. German Jews do this to begin with, and then Eastern European Jews continue to do this. And wherever they can make a decent living is where they settle down. And if they succeed, they stay there. If they don't, they move on to someplace else. Not necessarily any bigger, but could be. Now, if they have, eventually, if they have relatives in a big city, they might go to the big city, but you know, the pros and cons of living in small towns versus big cities. So the German Jews start this pattern and then Eastern European Jews will pretty well follow that, except by the time you have Jews coming in large numbers from Eastern Europe in the 1870s, 1880s, and thereafter, economic opportunities are in the cities and not in the small towns. So they are coming in to an industrializing, industrialized, industrialized society, and you know, they get the job where the jobs were. And that will probably be either some of them are still peddlers, but uh, but as we'll talk about next week, we'll talk about, talk about the Lower East Side. They uh, they you know, there were still plenty of peddlers in the Lower East Side, but they become involved in the garment industry, most likely. Or they were craftspeople of other kinds too. I mean, there were the early unions that are established in this country, which we'll be talking about in two weeks. Uh, were crafts unions. Uh, merchants don't unionize, but workers do. And 
most of, and so the, these were people who were, you know, house painters and plumbers and, you know, they, and they organized among the early unions. But of course, the largest, the most, eventually the best known ones are the ones in the garment industry. Why do Jews go into the garment industry? It's the only thing they could go in. Sometimes they couldn't get other jobs. Okay, so why could they go into these industries? I don't know. Maybe because they were owned by Jews. Ah! <laughs> German Jews German tend, to, Jews. tend to, own, to own German Jews, even though they're not from Germany. But okay, <laughs> uh, just, uh, it's an old habit, I shouldn't use it. But German Jews often own these beginnings of text, well, first textile factories and then garment factories. And they hired other Jews because. In most businesses, Jews don't work for other for, for Christians. Christians generally won't hire them. Mm -hmm. But Jews hire other Jews, not exclusively. But you know, you want some if you want a job, you go to a little answer. It's only come from wherever you come from. And uh, you uh oh you and, and in New York eventually you go to a shop, which we'll talk about later. Uh to which were people who came from the same town who Supported each other, who helped each other. Uh, they set up benevolent societies so that we'll pay for your burials. Now, burials, of course, are very important in Jewish communities. If there's for no other reason to identify as a Jew and you know want to be part of a community, it's in order to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. And in Jewish cemeteries in the United States. Century onward, Jews were going and buried in the same cemeteries. There's only generally one cemetery per town, and everybody was buried. Now, once you get to synagogues, <laughs> then you have five synagogues, and then you have several cemeteries. But in the meantime, the first one you always start with one. When you only have one, everybody in that town has to go to that community, that synagogue community. So the synagogue was the basic institution of certainly colonial or early American communities, was, they were all synagogue-based communities. Uh, the other organizations springing up later. later. But, uh, and every community, of course, has a cemetery, and often the first thing to be established is a cemetery. First of all, land that is bought for Jewish families to them would be a place to bury them. Okay. You know, sometimes you would bury their children. Mortality rate, but you were buried. The, there weren't that many older Jews yet. But as Jews get older and they die, they get buried in Jewish cemeteries. That goes on to the, I guess I could say, at least through the 20th century. Uh, even for people who never were affiliated with the community, somehow they're looking for a cemetery after they die. Spouses are looking for a cemetery for them after they die. And that is what the last thing that holds, what holds Jews together cemetery. Okay. Now, these days, not. <laughs> the last. Definitely the last. The last one, the individual, yes. But the reason why the family will approach a Jewish community or a rabbi is because they want to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. And uh, now, of course, there are Jewish funeral homes and lots of Jewish cemeteries. And after, after, after the 1860s, not all synagogues are synagogues, but not all cemeteries are synagogues. The first non-religious Jewish organization to be established in this country, which um, allowed people to be to socialize with other Jews without actually belonging to the synagogue, was maybe fourth or And anyway, what is the first significant Jewish men's organization? I No. Oh. <laughs> B'nai B'rith. Oh. <laughs> B'nai B'rith was established uh, by Jews uh, in the 18... And they were, anyhow, once you have fraternal organizations that men belong to, and okay, and the women start having women's organizations too, beginning in the 1820s, uh, you have women's benevolent societies. 
someone like Rebecca Bratz. So uh, she found some help in the first uh, Hebrew Sunday School Society, but also the first Jewish Women's Benevolent Society, Female Jewish Benevolent Society. Uh, and so you have these organizations inside. The female benevolent organizations do not tend to have cemeteries. B'nai B'rith, however, is an entryway into a Jewish community without being affiliated. Okay? So Jews don't have to affiliate with this country, but most of them do by choice or by necessity. Because in the early period, it was only through the synagogues that you could get financial aid. It's help. That's where you went. And they had, you know, in, in, and also in the synagogues, the synagogues were all the hierarchies and synagogues. The wealthy get the best seats. <laughs> now the best seats in the back row. It used to be the case. Gotta get there early. Gotta get there early. <laughs> but you know, it used to be on the you know, eastern wall. We wanted to be nearer it to Jerusalem, I suppose, uh, so that the wealthy they would sell seats for synagogues, as they still do. And you'll be assigned to seats depending on your wealth category. And um, so, and part of the reason why you get new synagogues established, not only because after the Spartans, you start to get Ashkenazi synagogues. First Ashkenazi synagogue was, was established there. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, it was Rudek Shalom. Um, it was established in 1898. By 1798. 1798, I'm sorry. 1798, uh, eventually became this long, it wasn't, it was established. And then they have pictures going on. Yeah. They go with that. Well, that's yeah. where uh, it was the first Ashkenazi synagogue in this country. And then uh, in New York, you don't get an Ashkenazi synagogue until the 1820s. Uh, but once you've got two synagogues, as I say, if you've got enough people, or you don't have enough people, you've got three synagogues. Two synagogues. Why do you establish different synagogues? I don't think it'll long. <laughs> That's a good question. They still don't, okay? They still split, and you know, and, and, and the splits have splits, and you know, but you have to have enough Jews there to begin with. In a small town, you still only have one synagogue that might be, you know, reform on Friday nights and conservative on Saturday, Saturday mornings. But uh, but in larger cities or established communities, you have what, what, what differentiates synagogues, even in the Eastern European area? When they come to yeah, where they came from, from. It, it, like you know, uh, the general in New York, they'd have small shoes, but they came from different. Okay. Yeah. yeah, in New York, because here. they have those that many people, they have Lansmanshaft, right. and a Lansmanshaft would have its own synagogue. Right. Okay, so if you came from a town and you daven this way, that's where you <laughs> that's where you join. Well, in cities, you might not have you might not all come from the same town, but they tend to come from the same region. Because there are certainly differences in prayer styles between not only Sephardi and Ashkenazi Jews, but but German Jews and Polish Jews and Hungarian Jews and <coughs> you name it, Hasidic Jews, non-Hasidic Jews. I mean, you know, whatever, Litvaks, Galicianers, whatever, whatever group you're talking about, they eventually, if there are enough of them, they will split from the main synagogue, and they'll have their own, even in a fairly small town. Uh, but they're very small towns in general. So I live there, I'm along the synagogue, and you don't affiliate. Um, okay, so uh, what else? What haven't I touched upon that I was planning on touching upon? Uh, any questions of the period before 1880 so that we can get, but ne next time we will talk about the development of the. Uh, new, okay. In Jewish, American Jewish history, you talk mainly about one place. And that is New York. New York. As if the whole world lived in New York. It just seemed that way. Okay. There are also other Jewish communities which are important in the 19th century and 20th century. Philadelphia. Eventually Boston. Boston wasn't created until the end of the 18th century uh, because um, they weren't very nice to Jews. Uh, but you have Jews in Rhode Island, but not in, not in Massachusetts. Um, and the, actually, the last state to actually give Jews rights was Vermont. So you are not find too many Jews in Vermont. Uh, but, uh, uh, and the first squabble over 
and giving rights to Jews actually takes place in Maryland in 1826 as to whether or not they could take an oath of office. That's what keeps Jews out of things, is because they can't take an oath. An oath is on a New Testament. Oh, yeah. You can't take an oath on a New Testament. Your oath really isn't valid. Our new governor had, uh, That's right. <laughs> yeah, three, 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 Jew, three Jewish Bibles. Yes. <laughs> it's that precise. <laughs> well, you know, we've come that far. You know, and look how far we've come. The Constitution says you're not allowed to do that. No religious the worst that. No, no, there's no established religion. No. But you have no. to take an oath of the, on the religion of your choice. Otherwise, it's not a valid oath. Jews cannot take a, an oath on the faith of a Christian with their hands on a New Testament. I thought the Constitution also says there's no religious. No established religion. No, there's no religious. There's no religious qualification for any office. Of course, that's federal. No, it wasn't federal before 1826. No, it wasn't the original Constitution, which has the Constitution has a Bill of Rights, which gives freedom of religion. Oh. But there were states where Jews couldn't hold office. Oh yeah. Okay, in lots of places. Oh yeah. But uh, you know, so it's, that's why you need to take an oath. It's when you hold an office, mm -hmm. not when you're a member. But they must be a member of something. I bought it back. Just pay your dues. Yes. You know, it's uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, when did Reform uh, Judaism come to America? Did that happen in the uh, 19th century? Yes, of course. Reform Judaism is a 19th century Central Europe phenomenon. Just about everywhere. Uh, and it doesn't happen in so much in the western part of Europe, it's Central European, it starts as German Jewish and Hungarian Jewish, the Hungarian reform movement too. Forget that, we'll never talk about it again. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the beginning of reform Judaism in, um, in Central Europe is actually Napoleonic Revolution and thereafter. And there were a series of rabbinic conferences in the, in the 1830s where you already have reformed rabbis coming to them. Okay. The Orthodox rabbis will not be seen dead in the reformed uh, To this day, <laughs> I don't think we're taking too many steps. Israel is not all that unusual. Not recognizing non Orthodox Jews. But in this country, reformed Judaism came into being by the 1860s and 70s. The platform that defines American Judaism in the 19th century was the Pittsburgh platform. And that is um, 1882, no, somewhere around there. It's in the 70s, 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 80s. Uh, and that is a fairly radical uh, reform platform, more radical than anything in Germany. All of the German the conferences in Germany end by around 1869, and that's where essentially where the reform movement becomes more and more established. And they thought that, and but reform in the 19th century thought before you know, before mass immigration, reform thought that they were going to be the future of American Jews. So they set up the uh, Hebrew Union College as the first rabbinical school. The Central Conferences of American Rabbis, CCAR, and also the um, uh, UAHC, the United Hebrew Union. Uh, um, no, HUC uh, is Hebrew Union College, but uh, the the uh, the Reform until fairly recently, the Reform Congregational uh, Union of American Hebrew Congregation, UAHC, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they thought that they were all American Jews who wanted to become reformed because that was American Judaism. It was known as Minhag America by Stephen Wise and even by the people that was left. This was Minhag America. Yeah, it was going to include everybody because that's the way you were going. If you weren't traditional, Trump Orthodox only really comes, comes about in the action to reform. You don't really have Orthodox Jews before you have reformed Jews. Have reformed Jews, and you start to have a lot of Orthodox Jews who are certainly farther to the right. And in Germany, they're only by the 20th century, they're a minority in the population. They're only about Jews, and at one point they were about 20% of them. So by the 20th century, Orthodox Jews are about 15% of the German Jews. 
because we form takes hold, but it's not we form so much as what we today would call conservative. Okay, with the seminary being the Jewish theological seminary in Wesley. Where do you think the JTS was? And where were the original teachers there from? Germany, yeah, well, it's, it's Silesia actually, which was never part of Germany. It, at one time, it was part of Austria. Uh, now it's part of Poland. But uh, we were there uh, when we visited. They were German speaking. These were all German speaking Jews. Yeah, it was. But now it's it's not Breslau at all. It's Wetzlar. Okay, um, and uh, not much of a Jewish community left there, but that was the. the was the equivalent of Cincinnati for uh, uh, for conservative Jews in England. But in by the end of the 19th century in Berlin, you got a, an Orthodox seminary, a conservative uh, traditional cemetery, semin uh, seminary, and even a. There were three. Anyway, there, there were more than one. So, uh, there was both Orthodoxy and, and, and Reform, and then there's something sort of in the middle. Uh, that's closer to conservative Judaism. Um, okay, I think our time is up. Any other questions? Good questions. Thank you very. Thank you. Very nice. Very, very interesting. interesting. Very yes. Yeah, when did or did supportive Jews and Ashkenazi Jews? They all belong to the same.